everyone knows that the brain is very plastic early in life. So from birth until about age 25, you can learn so much for better or for worse. I always say the downside is that early in life, you're, you have less control over your life circumstances, but your brain is very plastic. So there's a you know, dark and light to that. Later in life, you have a lot more control generally over your life circumstances, but the brain becomes less plastic. However, we know based on Nobel Prize winning work and recent work in addition to that, that the neuromodulator acetylcholine is secreted when we pay attention to something very specific. It acts as sort of a spotlight in the brain, making certain synapses, the connections between neurons, more active and more likely to be active again than others. So when you hear that song that you love so much and it moves you and you feel dopamine being pulsed into your body, that's a real thing. You're actually getting dopamine secretion. You form that deep association with that. And acetylcholine draws your attention to that. And that song is essentially wired in a very indelible way into your nervous system at multiple, you can probably even with certain songs, you can feel your body start to energize because of course the brain through connections with your muscles controls your body. So. For things that are traumatic or negative, what we're really talking about is neuroplasticity that's focused on unlearning. And most of the therapies for this, whether or not it's EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, or it's traditional psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, or it's somatic embodied release, big, you know, kundalini breathing type, almost all of those are designed to do something, which is to bring the person or you bring yourself into a state of heightened alertness. Right? You can't do this stuff when you're sort of half asleep. Heightened alertness and then focusing your attention on the traumatic or negative event. This is the way that it works. And then pairing that with something new. You know, Traditionally, this was done with things like NLP or in talk therapy where people would feel the, rela the positive relationship with the therapist. That was kind of the main rationale in association with this very traumatic, sometimes even you know shameful type events. And the idea is that you, you would simultaneously have those two experiences, the negative one and the feeling of safety, and you would rewire those circuitries. I actually believe that can work, but it can take a lot of times. It can take a lot of visits to the therapist, which is not to say it's bad, it's just not everyone has access to those resources. Things like eye movement desensitization reprocessing, simply moving the eyes laterally while recounting these negative events. The woman who devised this figured out that somehow when people recount these traumatic experiences, when they're doing these lateralized eye movements, not vertical eye movements, they somehow separate out the negative emotions. And I thought for years, people would ask me about this stuff, Tom, and I thought, this is ridiculous. First of all, I'm a vision scientist and I work on stress. It's like, there's no way. And then I really ate my words because four papers, two in humans, two in mice, and then a fifth paper published in Nature, which is kind of our Super Bowl of scientific publishing, showed that these lateralized eye movements quiet the amygdala. They actually suppress activation of this threat detection center in the amygdala. And Why would that be true? Ah, so this is really where it gets cool. Turns out, because of when the way that we view the visual world when we move through space, when our head moves or when we walk and things flow past us, that these lateralized eye movements are what happens when you move forward in space, when you're walking, when you're moving forward towards something. And that suppresses activation of the amygdala. Now you say, why? Well, okay, so then 2018, my laboratory did an experiment. It was actually a graduate student in my laboratory where we're looking at fear. In this case, we were looking at fear to big looming objects that either trigger freezing or running and hiding. There's a brain area that's in your brain and my brain that mice also have that triggers a third option, not run and hide, not freeze, but forward confrontation. This is the, no, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna move forward in the face of adversity. This is the growth mindset. I'm gonna lean into friction. And it turns out that this circuit is linked to the dopamine reward pathway. When we move forward in the face of a threat, and obviously we wanna do this in healthy, adaptive ways, we suppress activity of the amygdala through physical action of moving forward, and there's a signal sent to the areas of the brain that control dopamine reward, those reward centers then trigger the release of dopamine to reward forward effort in the face of stress or threat. So when you hear about people saying, look, take some physical action when you're feeling exhausted, take some forward physical action when you're feeling overwhelmed by this traumatic experience. Now that could be in the form of a walk, in the now, this therapist, she figured out with EMDR 
because you can't take people walking around for therapy sessions. She figured out that these lateralized eye movements are what triggers suppression of the amygdala. And it makes perfect sense because the amygdala, this threat detection center in our brain, it doesn't connect to the limbs. So how does it know if you're moving forward? Well, because the eyes are moving. You have these reflexive eye movements that move any time you're moving through space. So th to make Dude. this a, a little more succinct, it's really forward movement, action, pushing yourself across that threshold, not only rewards you, but it suppresses activity of the fear centers in the brain. And these are ancient hardwired mechanisms. These aren't hacks. These are things that mother nature right. installed in us. Forward movement, provided it doesn't endanger you or kill you, is absolutely the remedy for fear, stress, and all, and at least in the clinical literature to these sort of trauma events, you know, that, that people carry with them for many years. Of course, trauma needs to be dealt with, hopefully with a professional, but we can all apply these mechanisms and these neurochemical reward schedules. So the, the study that you're referring to is a beautiful one. Um, there's a classic study where researchers, not my lab, put two rats, or you could do this with mice, into a tube. And the tendency is for them to try and push one or the other one out. One always wins and pushes the other one out. We call the one that got pushed out the loser, the one that pushed him out the winner. Here are the interesting things about this. First of all, the winner will tend to win with other in other battles, even though these are just pushing battles, more because it simply won the time before. The loser, by losing, will tend to lose. And so people say, oh, well, that explains a lot about society, et cetera. Well, here's where it gets really interesting. You can even take a mouse or a rat and push it from behind and make it the winner. And then on subsequent trials where you're not pushing it, it will tend to win more often. So the win doesn't even have to come from itself. So last year, there was a very important paper published about this where a set of researchers just said, well, what is it? Like, what is this winning circuit and this losing circuit? Enough with the demonstration that this happens. Like what's happening on, what's under the hood? And so they went into the brain and they identified a brain area, which is part of the frontal cortex, the area that we typically think about planning, action, executive function, all the kind of high level stuff. And what they discovered was this brain area is more active in the winner than in the loser. In fact, they could take the loser and overstimulate this area and turn the losers into winners. Now, it gets even more ridiculous than that. If you quiet this brain area, winners become losers, okay? And and if you take a winner and let's say at this tube battle and you put them into let's say a cold environment with a bunch of other mice and you have just a warm corner, mice don't like to be cold, and you say, who gets the warm corner, right? Who gets the luxury spot? It's always the winner. So it even breaks down at the level of social interactions. And so you say, okay, all right, now we know that it's this brain area, it's this, it's this one area of the frontal cortex, but what's it actually doing, right? Okay, what's it actually, what, how can we translate this? Turns out this brain area that's responsible and required for winning in this series of experiments is actually driving up the level of activation, what you and I would call agitation or stress, to the point where that animal is more likely to move forward. It's simply taking stress, which is wired into us in order to make us feel agitated, instead of suppressing us, you know, instead of saying, you know what, I'm just gonna sit here, I'm overwhelmed, I'm not gonna do it, I'm just gonna move into action. So there's a circuit for winning. There's a, the same circuit when it's hypoactive, not active enough, is what causes losing in these competitive scenarios. And similarly, there's a circuit for quitting. There's an, a norepinephrine circuit in the brainstem, this was published in the last couple of years, showing that when animals or people are in constant effort, eventually that level of norepinephrine gets so high that it triggers a circuit that shuts down the motor control over the limbs and you just say, that's it, I give up, I'm done. So these mechanisms were hardwired into us. We all have them. Whether or not it's from evolution, mother nature, God, the universe, it is it's irrelevant to the discussion that these circuits exist in everybody. And I think it's a select few people who really understand that forward action is what drives these circuits. It's the ability to take that agitation, stress, agitation, increase our focus, and they bias us for movement. And Nature wanted that. They want us to move forward in the face of challenge, not to be quiescent. We weren't sitting around b battling tigers and saber-toothed tigers all the time. More likely we were in caves and we were getting hungry and we had to go out and search for things. Agitation and stress were designed to get us up and move us. And when we try and fight that too much and we try and quiet that stress,